The topic today is, is large-scale numerical experiments. Um, and uh, for those, that, those of us that, that do methodology development, uh, that's a big part of uh, what we do. Um, and it's also very hard. So it's hard to make this in a way that uh, is correct, that there's no software defect that is reproducible by other people in your group and people all over the world. Uh, but also that is scalable because often we want to try a lot of different parameters and this this can take too much time on your laptop so even even a small project can often require thousands of execution and 10,000 or more is not uncommon so if you're uh, starting a PhD and your method so far is to just do them manually and have like a, a Excel spreadsheet of everything then this is going to take way too long too long. So there's many tools to help you with this. And today I will present some of them, uh, some of the tools that we found most useful. So Nextflow and, uh, and Julia. Um, and uh, just to emphasize again, if at any point of the talk you have a question or a comment, please interrupt me. Um, I will, everything is, I'm not going, going to try to teach every single piece of syntax. The, the idea is more to convey the, the big the concepts and kind of motivation why you should learn these tools. And everything is is in that website that I've created for this talk. So you, you should be able to, to use this at home after, uh, hopefully. So Nextflow, we've been using this for uh, almost uh, seven, eight years in my lab. Um, we use it for two different streams of project. Often they intersect, but some of them are more in the bioinformatics uh, stream where you, you have to do processing on many, many files, for example, and have a pipeline. And for this kind of thing, Nextflow is very well documented. There's a lot of things that, that exist to document this. There's another use that we found, though, is to test methods. So we have, for example, MCMC methods. We want to test them on many different conditions. And we found that Nextflow is also really useful in that context. Uh, but we had to create a few tools to help uh, streamline this a little bit. And so what I did for this talk, I put them in sort of one and updated them a little bit, put them in a package uh, that uh, I call NFNest, uh, Numerical Experiment uh, Software Tools. And uh, this is what I'm going to present today. And I'm going to, that illustrates at the same time the, the main concepts of Nextflow that we're going to use. Um, so the aspects that this kind of pipeline take into account, so Nextflow uh, pipelines, uh, takes into account the fact that we want to uh, automate uh, cross product of input parameters. So we have some algorithms that can take maybe different random seeds, but also different number of iteration. And we want, maybe we have several of those and we want to take the, the cross product of all of those. Uh, we also want to automate submission of scripts. So when we use a system like Sokai, uh, uh, jobs are submitted with a Slurm, uh, a, a job submission system. And in a realistic script, there is maybe hundreds of these little jobs, or maybe not so little. And uh, we would like to not have to write the submission script by ourselves to have something that or orchestrated for us. Uh, also, from one job to another one, we might have to use different file system for uh, network versus scratch and so on and, and make sure that we don't overwrite files. And this just becomes a headache if you try to do it manually. So we want to automate this. When there's some part of the pipeline that we already did, we don't want to run it again. We want to sort of detect, uh, have some cache that can rerun uh, pieces that have already been run. We want to be robust for to failure. So if uh, there's uh, one job did not ask for enough memory, we would like, for example, to maybe request again a new, but with twice as much memory or something of that form. Uh, we want to have reproducibility with AppTainer and Docker uh, so that you don't have to have root access on the HPC, but also you can pass your next flow your pipeline to another researcher that is configured differently. And finally, we want to support the next generation uh, model of computing, which is based on GPU. So that seems like a lot to ask, but surprisingly, what I'm going to show today is that we can achieve all of this with very minimum uh, configuration and, and uh, playing around. So this is uh, the, the, the thing that I'll 
present today is a, a, a solution that has all these requirements. So as I mentioned, the technology task, the stack is, that we use is Nextflow and Julia. If we were to try to do all of this rolling it by ourselves, that would take a lot of time. So this is really possible because we have Nextflow, which really I think about as an operating system for coordinating numerical experiments, in particular on HPC. And Julia, which is a programming language that allows us to have full access to a high performance computation on both CPUs and GPUs. Um, and so there's some features of NFNest that I will present today that are Julia specific, but a lot of it is actually language agnostic. So even if you're a Python user, you'll be able to use, for example, Nextflow and um, the scripts that I talk about today to, to do uh, your work. So let me start with uh, uh, a bit of background on uh, the notion of scientific workflow. Okay, so this is uh, a concept that I think a lot of us have in an informal fashion, and a lot of us have seen it in papers with diagrams that look like this. Okay, so this is a diagram that was automatically computed by by the by Nextflow, and it's each node. Think about it as a separate process. So it's a, a different uh, Unix process that uh, actually might be on different computer. So these will be, um, many of those will be submitted in the, in the job queue. When there is uh, an edge from one to the other one, that means that there is what's called a channel. So some kind of dependency from uh, this computation to that other process. So this could be a file, uh, it could be a, 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 an environment variable, it could be a string. Uh, so this is something that we're going to see. Nextflow allows us a lot of flexibility on what these arcs can be. Okay? And the calculation down for, uh, for example, here, run Julia, will only start when this pre-compile uh, node is completed. All right? And so today, this is the main workflow that we're going to cover. So this is kind of like a small example of like a, a realistic uh, uh, scientific workflow that you may have. Um, so as you can see, there's, there's so, some nodes that are more um, preparatory. So it could be pre-processing here, pre-compiling the code, for example, downloading dependencies. Uh, there's running some Julia code. And what will be interesting for this node, actually, it will be one node can actually be several calculations. So some of these arrows will emit a single values, so that's called a, a value channel, but some of them will be a Q channel, where actually here we're gonna emit several combination of parameters that we want to test, and there will be one process for each, uh, each of these parameters. And later we're, I've got, we're gonna have some process that combine a bunch of uh, CSVs that were created by these experiments and finally plot it. Okay, so this gives you a bit of a, an intuitive idea of what, what I mean by a scientific workflow. Uh, so more, more, I guess, the abstract version is it's a, a, a directed acyclic graph where uh, there's an edge between n, node n, and n prime if at least one output of n is fed into process n prime. Okay? Okay, so next flow is gonna run this for us and uh, using a very short uh, syntax. And uh, to give you kind of a preview, the, the, this, this workflow, uh, I think, is called uh, many jobs. And this is a fairly, um, uh, no, sorry, it's, it's called uh, full. So it is not a, a very long script. So it's a script that you can write very quickly. And what it will do, it will orchestrate everything and produce these nice report that tells you uh, for each node how much CPU usage it consumes, how much memory it used, uh, and also some kind of a pipe a timeline of when, as you can see, many of these jobs were executed in parallel. So that's because we submit them in, in a job queue that allows us to have a built-in parallelism in our uh, execution of the workflow. Okay. And so maybe I'll stop here uh, before I go in more detail so uh, to see if there are questions on the, the conceptual notion of a uh, scientific workflow uh, that I'll be talking about today.
or anything that that you would like to 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 know if you're going to learn in this one uh, this one hour session or or anything you would like to see hi i have a quick question um i'm not very familiar with uh with this software but i was wondering like what's the difference between this and using like a shell script to the same great, workflow that's a great question so in some sense, what Nextflow will do at the end of the day is to generate several shell scripts. So in theory, this is all something that you can achieve with just shell scripting. But as we'll see, this would take much more uh, time and it wouldn't satisfy, especially if you want to satisfy all these requirements here, that could take an enor enormous amount of time to do it with shell script. Yeah. Uh, Tony Liang, I see you have a question as well. Oh, hello. I also have a similar questions regarding using shell scripts. So if this was um, creating multiple HPC jobs, uh, would the runtime be slower because you're scheduling so many jobs once you have so many parallel tasks? So of course, there if the job is extremely short, uh, there anything that has multi um, uh, distributed uh, computing as a sort of a, a constant cost associated with it. So if the, the task is only a, a couple of seconds, this is not a good approach. This is more an approach where each of these process, they might take several minutes or even several hours. And uh, this is where this really shines because then the, the sort of uh, constant cost of setting up this is, is quite uh, amortized. Yeah, thanks for the question. Thank you. Any other questions? General questions. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks for the question, and, and please keep interrupting. Um, so, in one hour, um, I will not have time to explain everything about Nextflow, uh, and I will not have uh, time to explain everything about Julia either. The good news is that both of them have excellent documentation. So, I just want to show the documentation and maybe highlight a few key point that, that will help you understand what I will talk about today. So yeah, the next flow documentation is very well maintained. It's very detailed. Uh, I would look at the script section. Uh, so the script section is essentially explaining how Nextflow is uh, uh, built on Groovy. So it's a language that's very easy to learn and you don't even have to learn it all. It's just kind of something that um, will, uh, will help you here and there. Um, when you, I will just emphasize one point here. When you define variable, it is imperative to have the def keyword in front. If you do not put it, this means this makes it a global variable. And since a lot of the stuff we do is multi-threaded or multi-processed, uh, the, the, this leads to catastrophe. So do not forget the def keyword uh, to make these uh, variable local and not global. Uh, everything else is very sort of intuitive, how to design list, how to design map. Uh, this is uh, easy to learn. Working with files, the main uh, keyword is, is file. So we're, when we pass around file, we're going to use that syntax. Uh, you can read a lot more details or you can have regular expression and so on. Um, the, maybe the, the first big building block in Nextflow is called the process. So a process is uh, encapsulating the information you need to run one Unix process. Okay, So this could be a bash process, this could be a Julia process, so on. Uh, but Nextflow needs to know if there are some inputs and output. And so these are, for example, specifying that this process will create a, a, an output file call called hello.txt. And this might be used by some other process later on. Okay? So by understanding these inputs and these outputs, Nextflow is able to draw that graph and un use that graph to schedule calculations. Okay? So for now, that will be, I will talk more about process, but just a brief introduction of what a process is. Uh, so it's a Unix process, but with more information. A channel, in, on the other end, is uh, a process was a node in the DAG, in the graph that I showed you at the beginning. A channel is an edge. So it's a dependency between one process and another process. In Nextflow, the main thing that you have to know is that there are 
two kinds of channels. Sometimes the, process, the channel is um, very simple. It only sends one value. So this is called a value channel. Another case is uh, a Q channel. So this is a case where we are going to send many pieces of information along that edge. For example, many files to be processed. And Nextflow is going to be is going to make this nice for us by making it uh, multi-process friendly. So these files might be produced asyn asynchronously and they might be consumed asynchronously and this will all be safe. Uh, so just keep in mind that yeah, when you see an arrow, it could either transmit a single value or several values. So that's the, the notion of channel. And finally, the, the notion of workflow is the last thing I will tell you about. So a workflow is essentially drawing that, that graph picture. So here I have a, a small example of workflow where I first run a first process called foo. And this process emits one output. And then I have a process called bar, which uh, takes as input what foo created. So this would be a simple graph with two nodes and one edge. And so more generally, workflow will, will, uh, will de declare that, uh, th that graph that I'm going to uh, submit on HPC or run on your laptop or whatever. Okay, so this is uh, all I want to say for now. As I move along, I will show you more example of these things. But keep in mind also that you have this excellent documentation that can give you more details on these. But I, do, I can take a question or two if, if people uh, are, are burning things they would like to know. All right. So for the Julia documentation, I will just mention that, again, it is excellent. And um, this uh, I encourage you to, to give it a try. It's a language that is uh, easy to learn and, and uh, very product can be productive uh, quickly. So the next part is the, the boring part. Uh, I will not go over all the details. So I wrote this page in my, uh, having uh, the audience's mind is, let's say that I have a new grad students and I want them to learn kind of what, did, what they should do to set up their Sokai account to be ready to do uh, numerical experiments. Uh, so this is kind of holding uh, a bit your hand and showing all the steps to do this. So I will go over this quickly and just highlight maybe some of the, the steps that you uh, that are more specific to this, this presentation here. Um, so uh, of course, so you should set up so that you have passwordless SSH, otherwise you go crazy. Um, one thing that uh, we've had quite a bit of success with is use VS Code for development. And this means that you can use VS Code, but uh, not on a project that resides on your laptop, but on a project that resides, for example, on Sokai. And this makes it really easy to experiment with uh, submitting job and monitoring jobs and, and so on. Okay, So there, I'll give some instruction here. It's very easy to do. And this will also manage your GitHub credential for you and do some nice things. So I encourage uh, you to, to try that, to use VS Code for, for Sokai, for HPC. Um, here's some... Uh, background on startup file. So I put it here because it becomes a bit more confusing how VS Code handles uh, uh, terminals. So I, I'm not going to read this, but have a look. If, if you're not familiar with startup file, maybe have a look at that. Um, we were going to assume that Git is installed. Uh, if you're in uh, HPC system, this might mean that you have to write module load Git. Uh, you don't want to do that every time. You want that to put that in your startup file. And so that's why you have this section here before that ought to add things in your startup on the right startup file. Uh, so this is one thing that I will assume. Some of the scripts that I present, uh, at least on Sokai, they need to know what is your allocation code. So the, the way we're going to do this is to define an environment variable. That's uh, typically that will be the... Uh, so that your, your PI that can provide this for you. Uh, it's, it's the code that you use when you submit uh, jobs to Slurm. And again, you will want to put that in your startup file. Uh, 
All right. Um, you will need to install Java. Nowadays, that's really easy. It's essentially these three lines. The reason for this is that Nextflow is built on Groovy for cross-platform uh, compatibility. And uh, Groovy is a, a flavor of JVM. Of, uh, so Java is needed. That's the only reason why it's needed. Finally, uh, in the last part here, in some of the part actually of this talk, I will assume that Julia is installed. Uh, right now, the latest version is 1.11, but they changed a lot of things in 1.11. So I'm going to recommend that for now, US install 1.10. That's the, the, the latest long-term support version. And uh, this is, again, very easy to do uh, by following these instructions here. Finally, the, the one piece of configuration that is needed for Julia is called a Julia Depot. So that's where Julia will put its package. So Julia has a package manager called PayKG, uh, and it it will download things for you and its and dependencies and this is a folder in which these dependencies will be stored the usual assumption for the julia depot is that each user should have one uh, julia depot on the laptop you don't even have to think about this on an hpc you do because the julia depot path needs to be accessible in a read write fashion by all nodes and ideally be on fast storage. Okay, so that means that uh, if you are on Sokai, the first choice would be to put it on burst storage. So if your, your group has burst storage, use this uh, line to specify that. If you don't have burst storage, then the next best, next best option is scratch space. So this is, uh, a, a, in Sakai would be a, a path of that form, scratch slash allocation code slash uh, username and allocation. Okay, so just some, some notes on, on that. All right. Any questions on the setup before we move, in, move on to more interesting things? All right. Now, let's suppose you, uh, you are going to start some experiment. So you have developed a method, maybe an MCMC method, a machine learning method, whatever, and you want to test it on many different uh, conditions. Um, what we will do is uh, create a, a new repository that will basically contain these numerical experiment. I use the terminology experiment repo for that. Okay. So this will contain basically the plumbing that need that is needed to do the numerical experiment. So what it contains, uh, essentially this experiment repo, it contains a next flow executable uh, so that it's really reproducible. So that this experiment repo contains the, the, the next flow program itself. It contains a config file for next flow that instructs Nextflow how to submit jobs, what are your preferences on how to submit, and so on. Uh, the next thing it contains, this experiment repo, is the uh, git submodule, so a repo inside a repo. Uh, so, so this is a, a repo nfnest that uh, we've developed in my group, and that contains useful tools that will uh, help you accomplish what you want to do uh, as I demonstrate today. So some extensions to Nextflow, essentially. And then finally, we'll, this experimental repo will contain your NF file that, your, that specifies your workflow, how, how it is uh, constructed. Okay? So um, this first page just explains the mechanics of how to create an experiment repo really quickly, because you'll often have to do it. Every time you write a paper, you might have several experiment repo for different aspects of the paper. Okay? Um, then there's the question in an HPC context, where should you put it, that experiment, experiment repo? Again, on a laptop, it really doesn't matter. You do as you wish. But in an HPC context, again, we will need a, a location that is read-write accessible to all nodes. Okay? So this is the same story that I covered for the Julia Depot. So if you have burst space, put in burst. If you don't have, put in scratch space. Um, and 
as we will see, we can, there's a bit of flexibility here. So Nextflow will also be able to use, so there's often storage that, you, that which is node specific for temporary files and things like that. So Nextflow can easily use that uh, so-called scratch, uh, um, another scratch, but uh, kind of a, a, a private scratch storage. Uh, but we still need this, this shared uh, file location to be able to pass around files and synchronize things. All right. So here's the instruction of how you concretely how you create uh, an experiment repo uh, that you to use the techniques I'll talk about for the rest of today. So first, I assume that you've created a directory and that you CD into it. It doesn't have to be called experiment repo, but in this documentation, I'll take it as a convention. You make it a git in uh, repo. This first line shows you how to install Nextflow. As you can see, it's extremely simple. I recommend that you do it in each repository. That makes it more reproducible rather than having it global. Then we add the submodule of utilities that I described. And then Nextflow assumes the config file to be at the root. So I'm going to just copy a, a template config file to my current experiment repo. Okay, so this is how I can quickly create an experiment repo for, for uh, uh, doing experiments on HPC. All right, so this, at this point, probably you, we didn't have time to do it all at home, it's a lot, but maybe you did. Uh, you should uh, be ready to start to launch a first experiment. So that's exciting. So let's, let's talk a little bit about that, unless there are questions on this set of instructions. Oh, I, one quick question. Yes. You mentioned Docker, uh, like how does it come into this workflow? Yeah, thanks for the question. So in uh, towards the end of the presentation, I will talk about how each process could actually have its own Docker container to, to ensure that it's fully reproducible. So I will get to that soon. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Any other questions? If not, then let's launch an experiment. So there, uh, for one Nextflow script, you can actually use it in two different ways. So you can use it in a local fashion where all the processes, i.e. the nodes in the workflow graph, they run in the same machine. Okay? So if you're in your laptop and you want to quickly test things, that's usually what you're going to do. Then there's a cluster mode where each node in the graph can run in different machines in a HPC cluster. Okay? Now, the surprising thing is that we will be able to go from the first, the local mode to the cluster mode by only adding this, uh, this little switch, dash cluster, dash profile cluster. And that's it. So let's see how this is possible. So first, I'm going to introduce an example Nextflow script, basically the simplest possible, where there's only one node uh, called hello that uh, output uh, as you can see here, by default, this is bash. So this is just uh, a small bash script, essentially. And here I write debug true because we want to show the output. By default, this, the output is, is hidden otherwise. And our workflow here means that we have a graph that has a single node. That's this node here. All right. So let's launch the script two ways. First, local. To launch it locally, you will CD into your experiment repo that we just created. And then I'm going to use this Nextflow executable that I've placed inside the repo. Okay. Now I use a Nextflow command called run. That's the main one that we're going to use today. And it takes as input uh, a Nextflow script. And here in my NFNest package that we took as a submodule, I've included some example, including the one above here. And what happens when I do this? is I see there's only one node in this graph. So each line here is a node in the graph and it gets executed. And here it shows its output. All right, so that's the first mode. Now let's move to the cluster mode. Now we want to run this on a cluster. So this documentation was compiled on a Sockeye. So I've just added this profile cluster in my notebook. And as you can see, the output looks uh, just the same. But actually something very different happened here. 
what happened is that this little bash script here was submitted to Slurm and ran in a different machine. Okay, so that's uh, the cluster execution mode. All right, so that's the 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 magic is because we provided this nextflow.config file that in the cluster profile give some instructions. So let's look at the next the, the config file. It has a certain profile called cluster, which gives to Sakai the needed information that we want to submit that using Slurm. We want to request by default one CPU. We want to request four gigabyte and so on. Okay, so this is uh, in other cluster, you might have to uh, edit the file nextflow.config. We've created it with Sakai in mind. All right, so in Sakai, it should be usable right out of, the, out of the box, provided that, remember, in the setup HPC account that you've denoted, you've, uh, you've defined your allocation code here. All right. Um, <clears throat> One thing I will mention briefly is, let's say that this is very short. Instead, you have a very long job that, you, that, that will take maybe several hours or several days. The architecture of NextFlow means that there will be one first job in the login node that orchestrates everything. So this, node, this job is actually very lightweight. It doesn't do anything. It just ping once in a while these jobs. But you uh, want to avoid to have this uh, orchestrating job to be killed uh, if you close the SSH connection. So in practice, what we do often is um, the following. So first, we log in to uh, Sakai, and we take note of which of the login node that we used or that we get assigned to. Once we are in log logged in, we use this utility called Tmux which is another that you might know is screen, which essentially keeps this uh, session inside Tmux alive, even if the SSH connection uh, disconnect. Okay, so you can list existing session with Tmux LS, and you can join the last one with Tmux A. Now, when you're inside Tmux, now you start the next flow. So you, you follow this uh, line here. And then let's say that your SSH connection get closed. You close your laptop, you go somewhere else. When you want to reconnect your SSH in Sakai or your HPC, you go back to your login node that you started the job and you reattach with Tmux A, and that will send you back to your next flow job. Uh, and if let's say you want to uh, cancel your next flow uh, work, uh, workflow, all you have to do is to click uh, press Control C only once. So this will not finish right now the, the, the process. What the orchestrating process will do, it will send uh, information to the Slurm uh, process manager to instruct it to cancel the jobs that uh, are in progress or not yet submit, not, not yet running, and then it will clean, it will finish gracefully. And so this, this gives you a nice way if you change your mind and you want to cancel a, a workflow, you do it this way and, and uh, cancel all the job without having to do any uh, chasing of submission codes and so on. All right. So this is uh, how to launch uh, an experiment. All right. Now, the next step I want, unless there are uh, questions on this, um, I will tell you a bit more about the mechanics of uh, how we do things in Julia on HPC. Uh, you, so let, let me talk briefly about this. So in Julia, we have a very nice package manager called PKG. If you're in a laptop, if you want to add a new package, it's extremely easy. You uh, just press closing bracket and then enter this will bring you to a, uh, to a package manager uh, terminal inside Julia. Then you would activate the current project. I'll tell you more about that soon. And you add a package with the name of the package being linear algebra or cluster manager or whatever. And when you do this, it will do actually two things. It will download the package and it will pre-compile it. Okay. Now in HPC, 
things are a bit more tricky because the second step, pre-compilation, it requires computational effort. So it's, best, it's better to do it, not in a login node, but in a compute node. But on the other end, many uh, HPC setups, such as Sokai, are such that compute nodes do not have internet access. So the process needs to be split into two pieces, the part about downloading and the part about pre-compiling. And here I will show how Nextflow can be used to facilitate this process, okay? So uh, let's talk briefly about first Julia environment. So what is a Julia environment? So it's a specification of all the package dependencies and their versions. Okay, so by convention, uh, we will assume that this is stored in a subfolder of experiment repo called Julia env. So Julia env is a folder that will contain uh, two config files that, that essentially tell Julia what versions to use and what package to use. So now I will show you how to add a package on HPC. Okay. Uh, there are actually two syntax. I will just talk about the interactive Jira package manager. As I said, the, to enter the package manager, we press closing bracket and then enter. But before doing this, we're going to add this magic line. So what does that magic line here means? It means don't pre-compile yet because pre-compilation is slow. We don't want to clog the login node. And we want to use several, we want to use a compute node with several threads. So don't pre-compile yet. Then we are going to activate our Julia environment so that we know where to, to specify versions and so on. And then we add a package. Here I add a package that we developed called pigeons that does MCMC. Okay. So this last syntax here is actually quite flexible. Okay, so you could add a package, you could add a package at a version. You can add a package at a commit, at a branch. Uh, if your package is not registered, you can add just a GitHub repo, okay, with maybe a branch or maybe uh, a revision and so on. So it's quite a flexible way of adding dependencies to your Julia project. Once you're done, you press Control C, okay. Now the next step is we want to pre-compile, but we want to do it uh, using, the, uh, using compute nodes. So in order to do this, we have written a small utility called pkg.nf. It's in that nfnest folder that we've added as a submodule at the beginning. And so what I do, I run this, uh, this little workflow and what it will do, it will pre-compile, but not on the login node, but on a compute node, by default, it will request 10 CPUs. So you'll get a faster pre-compilation, okay? Because Julia proceed by two steps. There's a first pre-compilation step that makes it uh, faster in the future, next time you use the package. And there's also just-in-time compilation, but the pre-compilation is, is essential to get uh, reduced latency when you import a package, all right? So once you've done that, you can test your Julia package interactively uh, by uh, starting a Julia terminal uh, and uh, using uh, this syntax here. So to make sure, so we, here we activate our uh, environment that we just pre-compiled. And as you'll see here, it will be very quick because things have been pre-compiled and you can use it, all right? Uh, if you have more info, if you want to hear more about package, it's a very nice package for a package, and you can look at the documentation there. Uh, it's uh, quite powerful. So are there questions so far here? Uh, yeah, I have another question. Thank also, you. Um, like overall, how would you place Julia relative like, to R and Python in your workflow? So, like which use case would you say like, this is where I want to use Julia? So one case that really shines is if you do uh, methods development. So for, for example, us, we do, in my group, we do MCMC development. Performance is very critical. And so by writing in Julia, we can first have a first prototype very quickly. A new student can quickly learn like a first prototype. And we can get to essentially uh, C level or, or, or um, 
uh, Rust level performance um, with the by just small modification in the code. Uh, so we had some a research meeting not long ago where we in literally one hour, a couple of Julia expert and a new PhD student, we managed to get a hundred times speed up on the PhD student code uh, by just doing live coding. The student did all the, 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 the coding and uh, we managed to get it to basically bare metal performance in one session. And there's, there's uh, not many other places where you can, we can get that kind of thing. So that's kind of where it's on when you, you really need high performance and full freedom of, so you can get full performance in, in Python, but often it requires using a domain specific language like JAX or uh, PyTorch and so on. So you can really get full flexibility of a, a programming language and, and both prototyping and high performance. And for GPU programming, it's also quite powerful. So I'll talk about that a bit soon. And so uh, that's, and of course, there's other cases where, uh, you know, R shines because it has a great uh, stats ecosystem, Python shine because it has a great ML ecosystem. And uh, uh, what's nice also is to, to be able to use several of these tools. So with Nextflow, that's one thing. We can have each process be a different language actually that uh, send around CSV files or, or things like that. So um, I'm a big fan of multilingualism for, for a language, um, both uh, natural language, but also uh, for a programming language. So, but thanks for the question, yeah. Any other comments or questions? All right, let's talk about Cross products, what do I mean by this? This is a very, I'm sure you've been as a scientist in that case situation before. You're interested in running a piece of code with many uh, different uh, inputs, or that should be inputs, and each, exec, uh, each um, of the combination of the inputs, we're gonna run it on different compute node of a cluster, okay? So here's the most basic examples, so let's say that you want to build uh, an addition table. So you want all the uh, computation of A plus B, where A range from one to three. And let's say you don't want just addition, you want multiplication too. So you want also A times B, where A is in uh, one to three. Okay, so this means that we need to do uh, 18 calculation. Okay, three times three times nine. And uh, one way to describe this uh, set of calculation we want to do, it is a cross product denoted by one, two, three, cross, one, two, three, cross, plus times, okay? So that's what I mean here. So let's see how we can do this in Nextflow using our utilities. So the key, there's some new syntax here. So here first an include. So Nextflow allows you to uh, take functions or process or workflow designed by uh, a, a library so that's these include line, that's what they do. They, I, we've added the sub module at the beginning, that NF nest. So we're grabbing some utilities that I'll describe, okay? When you want to design a, a, a cross product using the approach I will present, you first define a dictionary that for each item in the dictionary is a variable and the value is the, bus, the list of values that we want to investigate. So for example, this first year encodes the first part of the cross product one to three. The second is the second part, and then operation is either plus or, or times. So Groovy has a very rich way of creating this list. Okay, so creating list and log scale and so on. So you can look at the, the next flow documentation. I'm just showing the basic one here means one to three, and this is a list of two items. Okay. Now the next step is we're going to build a workflow, okay? And here, cross product is uh, a library that we've imported that will take this uh, dictionary and which is a map <clears throat> of list and will create a list of map where each item in the list maps variable to the current value that we want to to do an experiment with, okay? So configs now is uh, think about it as an edge in that uh, DAG of the workflow, but it will transmit many values, all the, the, the 18 values that I want to experiment with, okay? And I'm going to feed these 
uh, input configuration to a Julia process. Okay. So an equivalent no notation to define to write this workflow is this kind of Unix inspired uh, syntax. You could also write it like this if you're familiar with with bash programming. You'll you'll see that this is maybe more intuitive for you. Okay. But uh, I just used the more explicit here. Now let's look at what my Julia process does. Okay. Um, well, the uh, the first thing I was gonna, I'm going to instruct it to print its output. I'm going to request a very small amount of resource because this is going to be done again on the cluster. So each of these would take a few seconds. I'm just being generous here. And uh, but the, the the key thing here is that as input, I want the current configuration. So I want what is A, what is B, and if I'm going to multiply or add. Okay. So now this block here, I, I want it to be Julia, not Bash. So we've created a small utility called activate, which will essentially just give you that string. So it instruct uh, it instruct uh, Bash to use Julia for the, the following. And what we're going to do is we're going to take now config.first that holds A. Operation will hold either plus or times, and second will hold B. And so we're going to generate basically a bunch of these Julia code and submit each to a cluster and print the output. OK, so um, just to, to, to give you the, the, what, what it does. So when we, we submit on the cluster as before, what we get is now we, we have these 18 jobs that get submitted. And here we print all the output. So it works as expected. So the, the, that's the, the cross product um, uh, in a nutshell. Any question on that syntax here? That I, I went a bit quickly over it, so I'll give you a few seconds to, to stare at it. Uh, Tony Liang, you had a question. Um, is there a way that we can tell um, which condition of the cross product have failed or um, something have been wrong with it and then just resume that part? Yes. Uh, so let me um, point you briefly to the, uh, so the, the, maybe the most relevant thing would be if we look at the processes, there are several directives uh which are the the directive that we've used uh so far are things like uh specifying how, how many cpus to use how much memory another one that i i won't have time to talk about today uh, in more details is error strategy and so by uh we can have different policies to for example at by default if there's one error in the workflow uh the whole workflow will will stop and that's not very robust. The good news is that to make it robust is as simple as adding this line. So we can have error strategy ignore, where uh, if there's an error, it will just be skipped. Uh, so that's another example. And another example will be retry. So with retry, we can retry it and a, a fixed number of time. And maybe when we retry it, we, inc we uh, incorporate more resource, maybe more memory or more time uh, for the retry. So this is a bit more an ad more advanced feature, but if you look at if you want to look at it, uh, that's the, the the right place to to look. So that's um, uh, again. So I went in the next load documentation. I went into processes and then directives. So that's that's the error strategy directive. Uh, Nicola, yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Nicola, you had a question. Uh, yeah, I just had one question is often I find myself uh, instead of just using cross product, there's a scenario where um, the number of settings you want to consider for variable two depends on the value of variable one. So yes. it's kind of, uh, how do you handle these kinds of scenarios uh, effectively? Yes. So when you have a situation like this, I would... Uh, I would here look at this thing here, and this is a channel. Uh, and Nextflow has a bunch of nice operation on channel. 
And one of them, if I go back to the, uh, the Nextflow documentation, so if I look at channel, we have uh, things like filter, for example. So I would create the larger cross product and then I would uh, use a filter here as a Lambda expression that maybe test, okay, certain con con combinations of uh, configuration, I just want to, to skip them. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, that maybe we should, uh, we should add uh, an example of, of, the, of this in action, because indeed that's a, a frequent uh, occurrence. Thanks for all the good questions. So, um, all right. Um, so maybe in the interest of time, I'll move a little bit uh, slightly faster for, for the rest, just to give you a bit of uh, uh, everything is in, in that repo, but just to give you an idea of what, what's in there. Um, the next step that you often find yourself after building that cross product is to analyze it. So we want to uh, concretely uh, often each, we're going to organize things where each of these process they each create one or several CSV. And what we will want to do is to combine all these CSVs and add a column to these CSVs that tell you what are the, uh, for each row in, in the, the CSV for which input conditions uh, it was run. Okay. So to, ex uh, to illustrate this, I'm going to move to a more realistic example. So here we have variables. Instead of being A, B, an operation, here I'm going to use a seed. So that's often what we want to do. Try things with different random seed, 10 random seeds. And then this is an algorithmic configuration for my uh, MCMC, a parallel MCMC with different number of chains. Okay. So we are going to, that, that will create 20 uh, Julia processes and we want, they each will generate some CSV and we want to combine them. Okay. So, uh, the, the strategy in the, in a, that we're going to use is that each of these Julia process, they will create their CSV in a directory. And that directory, we are going to give it a name which encodes what are the input parameters that were used, namely seed and end chains. Okay? So this will be fully automated with the, a function called filed. So like it kind of file. Uh, the, the CSV automatically with a nice label. After that, we are going to have one uh, next flow process called combined CSVs that will look at all of these different uh, folders that were created and essentially create a new CSV. And this CSV will have uh, here two columns appended to the left. So seed and end chains, which will tell you for each row of results, what is uh, what was the seed used in the number of chains? So, the 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 to give you an idea of like the full script that created that big plot that I showed at the beginning. So going back to it finally. So this is what it looks like. It is not as daunting as as it looks like. So there's several things. So this is just import at the beginning. So we're importing some tools that we're going to need. We need to know what's the Julia environment that we're going to use. And we're going to use a plotting script because at the end we join all the CSV. We're going to want to do a plot with it. Okay, so I wrote some uh, old plot function in Julia. So I have my variable that I've declared so that I want to take the cross product off. Now let's look at the, the graph. So the key thing, I compile my Julia environment. So pre-compile and instantiate. I emit all these configurations. And now I'm going to run my Julia code that contains my environment so that I have the code uh, needed to run the dependencies and so on, and the current configuration. Then I feed this into a utility that was written in that uh, NFNest package called combined CSV, which does everything magically. Okay? And what it produces is essentially uh, for each type of CSV file that you've created, it create a combined CSV. We're going to plot from it. So let's look at, briefly at what run Julia looks like. So run Julia, it takes as input a dictionary that for e, uh, each variable gives me the, the current value I want to experiment with. 
And here is important, I need to output, I want the output to be automatically named to take into account all the configuration that we're using in the calculation. Okay. Now in my Julia code, there will be some part where I need to grab what is the current configuration for n chains. And so that's the syntax for it. So what that means is that next flow, when it, it submits this, this job, will actually substitute this string to, to have the value, which is what I want to, to, to have for this argument. And same for the random seed. Okay, so this is for the input. Now for the output, what we want to do is to output it in a, a folder that's named as this magic name created by filed. And in it here, we put a summary a CSV and maybe another CSV, okay? And finally, from plot's point of view, what is uh, provided as an input here is a folder that contains only two CSV, okay? One called summary.csv that combines all the information and one called swap protein.csv. Okay, so this means that uh, at the end I can create a plot that summarizes all these conditions together. Okay, so I'm, I apologize for running a bit out of time here. Uh, I'll just say that you run it the same way that you would do it we've seen before. Um, there's some, maybe in the last three minutes, I will just explain a bit what else is in this repo that, that might interest you. There's some instruction for accessing the output um, uh, that uh, covers a notion called deliverable. So you can have like these nicely organized folders that uh, include uh, the sort of information that was used for each run, okay? Um, the short answer for, uh, I talked briefly about container that, so containers are possible. At, they are just, they involve adding a directive that tells you to, to use a container. Um, and the question, maybe if some people can stay a bit longer, I can talk a bit longer about these things. Um, there's some instruction on how to do GPU uh, programming uh, using that infrastructure. Uh, and a bunch of different tips for uh, how to do things like having your workflow have themselves input parameters, um, how to do dry run. So when you, you, you have a big workflow, you don't want to, uh, to uh, wait very long every time you change or something, you want to have a, a way to quickly do development of, of workflow. So that's what this covers. Um, some instruction on how to uh, go from a, a repo of experiments to a published paper uh, using smart way of uh, committing things in the, in the repo, how to update your code, uh, and how to create these, these nice reports that, I've, uh, that, that are uh, done for you by Nextflow. So I apologize for a bit of the, the, the time management at the end that was a, a bit tighter than I hoped. Um, but I, uh, I don't have anything right after, so I can take some uh, questions. And uh, thanks, everyone, for the, the, the questions and comments uh, during the talk.